And now, I have the honor to introduce this morning's guest speaker, Reverend Michael Record, who will challenge your intellect to spring over our most mundane considerations. Reverend Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Good morning, friends. I think the reference, the spring forward, was to the fact that daylight saving time is now in effect in North America. Here in Jamaica, it's nice and beautiful and warm. So a warm, warm, Jamaican welcome to you worshiping this here at the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living. And greetings from sun-drenched Jamaica to those of you listening via the internet. If you're in the cold, remember, relief is just a plane ride away. In your program, I'm sure most of you, but perhaps not all of you, realize there is a do you want to know the answer column. It's, today it's on page nine, and the question is, can writers be metaphysical? That column in January's program carried the headline, The Power to Demonstrate. And I thought that it was a good topic to explore for today's talk, which I've entitled, Let's Demonstrate. The question asked in that January column was, as we reach higher levels in consciousness, do we gain more power to demonstrate? The answer was, undoubtedly, the more inclusive our consciousness is, the greater its possibility. We can only give what we have. If we wish to experience more, we have to become more." Unquote. Becoming more, that last phrase there, means, according to the logic of the question, rising to higher levels of consciousness. Some feedback, please. If you would like to demonstrate more, please raise your right hand. Keep it up, please. If you'd like to attain higher levels of consciousness, raise your left hand. OK, thank you. You may return your hands to your laps or to your neighbor's laps if you are holding hands. Raising your hand implied that you understood the meaning of consciousness, the levels of consciousness, and of demonstration, which is great. You've learned the jargon of sense of mind, because those phrases are in our specialized language. For the benefit of newcomers and new listeners, sense of mind is what our teaching is called. And for the benefit of those new people, I'll be discussing the terms demonstration and levels of consciousness in this talk. For you advanced students, all those who put up your hands, this talk will be a refresher. Let's start with the term consciousness. It's a concept which is at the very heart of our teaching. Outside of new thought, the word simply means awareness. In non-human animals, by and large, it's awareness of the world around. In humans, it includes self-awareness. In new thought, however, that term consciousness has a peculiar meaning. In brief, it's the sum total of your thoughts, feeling, emotions, attitudes, your habitual state of mind, your temperament. That's, that's in brief. A more complex 
description is given by Dr. Ernest Holmes, founder of religious science, in his major literary work, The Science of Mind, a book this thick for those who don't know it. He points out there that there is both objective consciousness, which is the upper level, semi-controllable one. We, we can't totally control it, but we can to a great extent. There is that objective consciousness. And there is subjective consciousness. The latter is the subconscious, sometimes called the unconscious, which we have only indirect access to and control of. About the subjective consciousness, Dr. Holmes writes, and I quote, it is creative but not discriminative. It is, of course, conscious, but it is not self-conscious. It is conscious in the same sense that the soil is conscious of the seed. It knows how to produce a plant, but it is not conscious that it is producing it. It has no reflective, deductive, or discriminating, discriminating factors. It is compelled by its very nature to accept and create. That's the subconscious, I unquote. What the subconscious automatically, indiscriminately accepts as true is what the conscious mind tells it. That's how it works. There's a conscious mind which we can, to some great extent, control. There's a subconscious which we can't really control. We only control it indirectly by giving information to it through the conscious mind. The subconscious accepts it, and not only accepts it, but it acts upon it. Now, the implications of that are enormous. Why? Because, for one, much of our day, perhaps most of our day, we go around governed by our subconscious mind, by, in a word, habit. But there's another more important reason. As Dr. Holmes points out, the subjective mind get this, is part of the universal, infinite, subjective mind. Our subconscious, subjective mind is part of universal, infinite, subjective mind. Now, by definition, infinite mind is infinitely powerful. So think about the implications of your having an infinitely powerful mind. And remember, it's not infinitely powerful on the, subcon on the conscious, controllable level. It's infinitely powerful on the subconscious level, the level beyond your direct control. At that level, from that level come your terrifying dreams, for example. It is from that level that comes your fears. And that is what is infinitely powerful. Perhaps just about now, you're thinking, maybe you'd prefer not to have an infinitely powerful creative mind, considering that you often think unpleasant things. Well, Sorry, too late, you've got it. That infinitely powerful mind comes with being human. And don't think that I'm feeding you stuff that Dr. Holmes made up just recently in the, in the 20th century. Though we are part of what's called the New Thought Movement, our roots really go back for millennia. 2,000 years ago, for example, Jesus was talking about consciousness in the same sense that we use the term, not in the general sense of awareness, in the same sense that we in new thought, in religious science, in science of mind, use the term. 
If the translators of Jesus' words knew about our use of the word, they probably have used it. And the Bible, believe me, would be read in a very different way. But they didn't know. And so we read of Jesus talking about the power of faith and belief instead of the power of consciousness. When he told the world, your faith has made you whole, and when you pray, believe you have the thing and you shall have it, he was referring to their consciousness, the prayer, the people praying. To my mind, that is the most important, most radical teaching of Jesus. He's telling us something which, as far as I know, no other religion teaches, that there is a direct causal relationship between your beliefs, which is a type of thought, and the circumstances of your life, a direct causal relationship. Among the circumstances are, very importantly, healing and abundance. Jesus told the world that you can heal yourself by your thoughts and attract abundance with your consciousness. In the consider the lilies of the field verses, for example, where he tells his disciples that they should have faith in God's givingness, he's speaking of abundance. You'll remember the passage, I'm sure. He says, the lilies of the field neither toil nor spin, yet Solomon in all his glory was not as beautiful as they are. Jesus is teaching, as we do, that the creator of the universe just naturally pours down its blessings on its creations indiscriminately. It is up to us to have the right consciousness to receive the blessings. That teaching was revolutionary back then. And the Bible tells us that Jesus not only said it could be done, he didn't only teach that it could be done. He went out and he did it. He healed the blind, the crippled, the insane. He even, according to the Bible, raised the dead. And he said that what he did, we could do too. How? The only answer is that Jesus was saying that he was not exceptional, that all human beings have the power of God in them. That's the only answer. That message had not been taught before, and no one, until new thought came along, has taught it since. Not even, ironically, Christianity, which was founded on Jesus' teachings. What a lot of Christian churches, I'm speaking in a general sense, teach, what they teach, is that to be healed, you must first ask God for healing, then he'll think about it, and based on certain considerations, he will heal you, or not. That's a two-part process. First, you pray, and second, God considers and either grants or not grant your prayer. But religious science teaches, as I submit Jesus taught, that there is one step in healing and in getting the other blessings of nature, abundance, etc. That step is the, the act of believing in your wholeness automatically makes you whole. That's what he taught. As when you pray, believe you have the thing already and you shall have it. There are three newcomers, three visitors here today. This talk was written specially for you. A newcomer to religious science may wonder about Jesus saying that when you pray for something, you should believe you already have the thing and that will cause you to get it. The newcomer might say, it is because I know I lack the thing that I want it. Those of you here who have done any classes, and this is a plug for doing classes, 
you will instantly recognize what is wrong with that attitude. The key word that the, the newcomer used was lack. He says, I know I lack the thing. And that is why I want it. You see, the reason that your belief in something or condition results in your getting it is that universal creative mind works through reflection the way a mirror works through reflection. Your consciousness is reflected automatically in your environment. It's a one-step process, I'm saying. Not the two-step process that has thing that Christianity and other God-oriented religions teach. Specifically, if you have a consciousness of love, the things, the conditions, and the people in your life will be lovable, love-filled, loving, and lovely. Automatically. If you have a consciousness of fear, which, by the way, is the opposite of love, it's not hate. If you have a consciousness of fear, the things, conditions, and people in your life will be frightening or will be afraid, as the case may be. Automatically. You see, universal mind, God, can only say yes to our consciousness the way that a mirror can only say yes in its, in its way. Now let's talk about change. To change what is reflected in the mirror, you have to go back to source and change what you are holding up before it. So too, to change what's in your environment, and I mean the conditions, the objects, the people, etc., objects like houses and cars, that's what I mean, not just little things, all the objects and the people, the, the people in your relationship, the loved one, etc. To change the things if you wish to, you must work back on the source, which is your consciousness. Forget about trying directly to change your environment. Change your consciousness. The new student may ask, you mean you can change the environment in your workplace? You mean the, like the furniture, the people, the atmosphere, etc., by changing your consciousness? So the newcomers will ask. Yes. Last week, Carol Charlton told us how by affirming every morning as she walked through the door, I'm so, I'm so sorry, it says Campbell. Carol Campbell, right here. Every morning as she walked through the door, that her workplace was calm and peaceful. That's what she affirmed, though in fact, she perceived that it wasn't. Because she did it, she was able to make it so. It took her a month to get the troublemaker out who was causing the disturbance. But that's because she was not a practitioner at the time. Now it would take her half the time. And if she becomes a minister, she'll probably be driving cantankerous people from workplaces within a week. It's your levels of consciousness. You will say there that I'm assuming that practitioners and ministers have higher levels of consciousness than laity. It is an assumption, yes. But I think a warranted assumption. So the newcomer may say about that cantankerous pe person that Carol influenced to drive out. It wasn't directly. She was talking to herself. The newcomer might say, how is that possible? You mean that you can affect the behavior of other people? Well, the quick answer is that that's simply the way the universe works. Because why? There's only one mind. So what you put into your mind affects the universal mind. That's, that's how it works. The, the newcomer, though, may want to know the details, the, the why beh behind the what is happening. And then they might be refer to science, the science of vibrational energy, attracting like magnets, similar vibrational energies in the environment. That's the scientific explanation behind what we in science of mind teach happens, what actually does happen. 
I need to say something about the lack that I just mentioned. In reality, it does not really exist. It's a figment of your imagination. There really is only abundance in this world. Think about this example. You can have several truckloads of money, and you can touch the money, it's there. You can't have several truckloads of poverty. It doesn't exist in reality. Poverty is the absence of the abundance of whatever, money or friends or whatever it is. You can think about the lack of money. Of course, you can think about it just as you can think about a unicorn, but they are not real. Thinking about it will affect you, but the point I'm making is that these things are not real in themselves. You, they're not entities. You can't touch them the way that you can touch money. And the point is important because when you think about it, you'll admit that it's silly to focus your infinitely creative mind on something that does not really exist, like poverty, like lack. True belief in lack results in lack. But since it's, it doesn't exist, why not instead believe in abundance, which does exist? And because of the reflective nature of mind, what will you automatically get when you believe in abundance? Abundance. To go back to healing for a moment, medical science now firmly believes in the mind-body connection that Jesus taught. It has taken 2,000 years for science to begin to catch up, but it's becoming it's still a pro in process, able to explain how it is that mind affects matter. Or should I say that there is no essential difference between mind and matter. They're all made of the same fundamental God stuff, the same fundamental God energy. Now that you're convinced of the creative power of your thoughts, don't be frightened that every negative thought will necessarily result in something negative being demonstrated in your life. Research has shown that we have between 12,000 and 50,000 thoughts a day, and many of those thoughts contradict each other. So many negative thoughts, and by negative I mean the things that you do not want in your life. Many of those get canceled out as soon as they are born by the, the positive thoughts which come about. So, incidentally, all thoughts are positive in the sense that they all cause things to happen. From consciousness now, let me move on to the second term that I wanted to address, levels of consciousness. There are two aspects to it. One level relates to the level of alertness. There are four ordinary levels of consciousness. You can be very alert, you can be relaxed, you can be drowsy, and you can be asleep, perhaps dreaming. You can be aware of yourself in the first three levels, the alertness, the relaxation, and the drowsiness. You can be aware of yourself. You are not conscious, of course, of the fourth level, the sleeping level, but we know that it exists. A scientific observer of those levels can, with instruments, actually detect the brain waves which correspond to those levels. Those brain waves are beta waves, alpha waves, theta waves, and delta waves, respectively. But there is another level of awareness, the meditation level. Alpha waves, those are the ones in the relaxed state are the most common waves associated with meditation. But during meditation, there's also an increase in another type of brain waves, gamma, gamma waves. And they're present in the part of the brain linked with positive emotions. Spiritual people have long touted the benefits of meditation, and now there is scientific evidence for it. Now, I invite you to think about the connection between 
This aspect of the term level of consciousness, and the second one, which is more metaphysical, consider a vertical spectrum, like a ladder, with fear at the bottom and love at the top. In between, fear down, down here and love at the top could be hate and dislike and fondness, etc., moving up. What science of mind teaches is that the love level is the highest level. So those are the two levels of consciousness. There is the level relating to love and fear, and then there is the level <coughs> relating to the the brain waves, the, the states of alertness. Those are the two, the two types of levels of awareness. So let me conclude the analysis. What, the two, what do you want to, to know answer column is saying is that the higher the level of your consciousness, that, it, that is the closer to the love level, the better you will demonstrate. The more you love, the more easily you will demonstrate. And remembering that what the brain wave scientists have found, it could also be that the more you operate from the meditative level, that is the level where I might add you experience things like unity consciousness or conscious consciousness. It's unity consciousness or cosmic consciousness. At that level, you, you may realize you, you will be able to demonstrate better things at that level, from that meditative level. So what we want to do this morning as a result of this analysis is to regularly set our intention to reach the highest levels of our consciousness and let us stay there as long as possible. Let us help demonstrate a wonderful world. Namaste.